Hi, I'm Mike with Uptastic. I'm here again at SCNA. So I'm sitting down with Corey Forey. Corey Forey leads the development practice for Eighth Light in Florida, but he uh, has a long history of speaking and teaching, uh, going back to well, Dot .NET and Blackberry days, and you were a consultant uh, uh, there. Um, but Eighth Light is really well engaged in the community, or, or they make great efforts to be engaged. What is it that you're doing down in Florida to take what the culture is of Eighth Light in, in Chicago to Florida? So I think to answer that, uh, maybe stepping back a little bit of, of how I came to launch a Florida office right. of, of Eighth Light. Um, so uh, my previous position, I was doing a tremendous amount of traveling. I did like 50,000 miles in January and February alone. In, in, in two months. In two months, right. Oh my. Um, uh, a big chunk of that was, in, was flights out to India and things mm -hmm. like that, but it was still a lot of travel and I have family. and. So we were trying to decide what the next step was going to be. Mm -hmm. And um, I have spent a lot of time working with, with organizations and I wanted to be in a position where I had the opportunity to influence the technical direction of it if I was gonna go work for right. a product company. And um, so I did one of the craziest things I've ever done uh, back in like November, December. I did uh, around 21 interviews or 19 interviews in three days. Wow. Uh, oh, you, you are used to travel. Well, right. So I flew out on a Monday morning and went to Silicon Valley and spent two days there. And I interviewed with like 11 companies. And then I flew an overnight red eye to Chicago and interviewed with five or six companies here and different people, kind of exploring what was out there. And the thing that I found was I was interested because it's passionate communities that are out there. We hear a lot about Silicon Valley. We hear a lot about Chicago and New York and Austin and areas, Denver, things like that. Right. And I wanted to go out there to say, maybe I need to be a part of this. Maybe right. there's something so amazing happening that I have to move my whole family out here. Mm -hmm. And what I found instead was a lot of smart people doing smart things. There's no doubt right. about that. But there was nothing that made me say, A, I have to be here. I right. have to relocate my whole family. And the second thing was, I didn't see anything that said that we couldn't do something similar down in Tampa and down in Florida. Right. Um, are there challenges? For sure there's challenges. So it led me to say that what I actually thought my next step was going to be was launch a company down there and bring the practices and principles that I strongly believe in and the value systems of how I think companies should be run uh, to Florida. So um, then in March, early March, uh, end of February, early March, I had a phone conversation with uh, Micah uh, Martin and Paul Pagel who run 8th Light. And um, what we decided uh, was in the I, I called them initially just to say, how did you guys get started? And that, and instead of the phone conversation, uh, what we found was there was a lot of, I'll use the word synergy, right? There's a lot of uh, similar value systems between us. And they were trying to figure out how to grow the company and was a geographical growth a good next move for them and who would even do something like that. And uh, so, so I kind of just said, hey, you guys ever think about opening a Florida office? Yeah. And they're like, maybe we are thinking about that. So. <laughs> Um, so in March, we launched the Florida office down there um, with just me, uh, and we're already up to six people, and we're shooting for probably ten by October. I'm sorry, by summer of next year. So, what kind of uh, community things have you brought, and what what do you identify as, as uh, between yourself and Eighth Light that you're you're taking down to Florida? What are you? What is it that you're doing down there? So I think there's three key things. I think first of all, for the companies that are down there, we're giving them an option that hasn't existed before. Um, there in, in the Chicago area or in a lot of other areas, there are craftsman shops that, that exist. We don't see that as much down in Florida, especially in the, the Tampa area that we're in. So we're giving companies a chance to see there is a company which cares about craft. There is a company which cares about delivering in value and, and those kinds of things. Um, secondly, what we're giving is developers down there an opportunity to say there's something other than just maintenance jobs or, right. or .NET jobs or Java jobs, right? There are companies who are out there who want, who, who A, care about investing in you, uh, and, and B, are on the cutting edge of pushing what the technology stack looks like. Right. Um, and I think that the third thing that we're bringing is the uh, opportunity to share with the broader community interesting topics that they may not have otherwise heard of. So, for example, um, we've already run some code retreats down there. Okay. Um, we uh, A couple years ago, I ran a, a Day of Ruby event. So it was a chance to have uh, to teach people Ruby on Rails from scratch, right. and we had over 90 people show up for that. 
And so bringing though like another Ruby on Rails, uh, Haskell one, Erlang, uh, NoSQL, those kinds of things, we're going to be able to sponsor those kinds of activities and opportunities down there for the broader community. And, and it sounded like, uh, my next question was going to be, has there been, it seemed like well received, has there been hunger for it, but you said there was 90 people that came out for a first event. That sounds like it was really well well received. It was, and that, that was a couple years ago before I, before we started the 8th Light down there, but there is that hunger, for as there is anywhere, right? There's not any time something new that, that people, right? Developers are the kind of people who are interested in learning. Right. And when you give them the opportunities, especially safe opportunities to do that, um, they they seem to really want to latch on to that. And uh, do you have any advice? Uh, I mean, because you're kind of going into an area that didn't have an established, or at least I don't understand that they had an established community. Do they, were there already user groups down there? Or? Very much so. So oh, okay. Tampa is a very large uh, Microsoft community. Uh, okay. But there is a very active Tampa Ruby users group out uh, of, of Tampa, uh, led by Jason Fraley and Gavin Stark, and they do a phenomenal job with it. Um, and they, knowing them has been a, a, a great asset, saying there's a lot of support down there. And we do okay. have some shops that are doing Ruby on Rails, um, and they tend to be a little either very small boutique shops or broader, um, uh, larger corporations that uh, people have brought that, that um, concept in. For example, there's a company called WellCare, which is a, a medical health insurance company com company thing, and um, there's a, a guy Brian Telson who brought who now is very involved with the Go programming language, but back then brought Ruby and Rails into the middle of a, a .NET shop. So there's there are visionaries down there, and what we're trying to do is push forward and say. Um, now there's a company down there who is practicing these principles right. and values as well. So it's it's an opportunity to say this is an example of a company that's doing well doing these things. Yes, that's correct. And it, okay, and then you can come and learn from us. That's right. Yeah. And um, um, have have you guys done anything like the Aether Universities that they do here in Chicago, or is that something you're still trying to? Work out. So it's both. Um, yeah. What we uh, do right now is we have an open invite to the community to come for Eighth Light University, and we stream the Chicago one, okay. um, primarily because we're still small and we were growing that, um, and we were trying to decide what we were going to do with it. Um, I think what we're going to start looking into next year is opening that up broader. We're growing as a uh, larger size group as well, right. so we'll be doing a mix of in person plus streaming uh, from the Chicago office. Do you, for somebody that's maybe in an area. It, it sounds like uh, they did have a pretty robust community after all, but if you're in an area that maybe doesn't have a community, have you, you've, you've been all over, has, has there been any place where you could say, There's, this is right for a community, but they don't have something right now, I would have, you would have some advice for, for how to start making something happen in that area? Um, so that that's a good question. Um, I think that there are places, um, certainly here at the SCNA conference that we're at, mm -hmm. um, I've talked to people who have very small user groups, three or four people, and they're right. plugging along with that. Um, and uh, what, in fact, I was speaking uh, two nights ago uh, with the, the guys who created uh, or who started, um, uh, oh, they're going to bother me, up in right. Wisconsin. I, the name completely escapes me for some reason. Um, and they talked about how it grew out of a community effort where they had a very small user group and then they advertised on meetup.com. Right. Um, and I think that that's kind of the thing is people aren't going to go searching out necessarily for a Ruby users group, right? It's, um, it's saying we're part of a broader technical group. This might be something you would want to be a part of. Um, the other thing that we see a lot of are um, bar camps, right? So bar camps and, and code camps. Low ceremony. Low ceremony things. Um, in Tampa, we just had a bar camp, code camp. They combined them, and there was 1,200 people who showed up for it. Wow. Um, which shows that there is a thriving community there, and then it's how do we convert that. So I think in smaller communities, it's a matter of getting the word out in ways that you might not expect people. People may not search directly for a Haskell users group right. or Ruby users group. Um, doing, uh, looking at other users groups and doing presentations there. Right. So going to a .NET users group and saying, hey, let me show you what Iron Ruby looks like, right? right. right. Um, I think it was two or three years ago I spoke at Microsoft's Mix conference on Iron Ruby of all right. topics, right? Um, right? Right in the heart of that, uh, of, of the Microsoft land, and we've seen a shift in, not because of my talk. No, no. Sure. But, it, but we've seen a shift in that, right? And so I think you're going to see people who are interested in mixing things up and combining efforts to, uh, to make interesting things happen in smaller communities. So that brings us to one of the other topics we talked about was talking um, to different types like uh, Microsoft uh, 
and this is in the slam on Microsoft, it's just it's an observation that a dominant developer usually calls themselves a dominant developer. A Java developer calls themselves a Java developer. Or I should say, uh, even I'm loaded in the words there, a person who works with .NET primarily calls themselves a .NET developer, and they start to identify with that platform. Uh, a person who predominantly works with Java calls themselves a Java developer, and they, and they identify with that. But the software craftsmanship um, uh, conferences are a little bit more polyglot, a little bit, we have people that do .NET, we have people that do Ruby, we have people that do all different things. So you, Haskell, yeah, yeah, and, and, and it's a, it's a little more polyglot ish. Is it different when you've gone and spoken to um, a Microsoft oriented conference versus coming to like an SCNA here? Well, so I think uh, to start off with, it's people identify with the groups that they are out of necessity mm -hmm. um, because those communities tend to reward people who. Um, integrate very tightly with those communities right. and they see a lot of benefits and rewards out of them. Um, one of the things that is interesting about what has actually happened this weekend over SCNA is if you listen to the different talks, what people are finding is that by being influenced by other programming paradigms, they're able to make their own code more pliable and cleaner and faster. Um, so I gave a talk yesterday morning on uh, learning code and one of the things I said was even within uh, a code base, you can have different dialects, and that's what coding standards are for. But um, by looking at other paradigms, we influence how well we're able to communicate in our base language. So what the, the big thing that we're seeing in here is the influence of functional languages on object-oriented uh, programming. And, and so, so to your point, I think that yes, there is a lot of insular culture for these conferences. Mm -hmm. um, just like here, at SCNA, we would probably not open our arms to somebody who was, you know, wanting to say, I do waterfall all the time, yeah. at, right, and I don't do any tests and I'm awesome, right? right. Um, there, that, that's a natural part of, of what it is, and I think you have to look at, at different things. So it's not so much the community as the individual. And the, my stance on craftsmanship is the responsibility of learning and growing is not on the company, but it's on the individual. Right. And so you have to make that decision and have to see that value that by learning different languages and different paradigms, you're going to be able to influence and become a better developer in your own language and in your own culture. Okay. Well, thank you very much for taking the time to sit down. Thank you very Appreciate much. It.